Before I move on to the American Revolution, I want to mention that in spite of the memory in the U.S. of British settlement in North America, in the 17th and the early 18th century, Britain's main focus was the Caribbean. We tend to forget this because this region did not join the North American Revolution in 1776 and become part of the United States. As a matter of fact, many loyalists who resisted the American Revolution moved to the Caribbean afterwards. But in the 1600s, sugar islands like Barbados and Jamaica were the most profitable British colonies. Like the Spanish, British colonists in North America and the Caribbean had hoped and expected to find not only a place to build a new society, but also a place where they could get rich. Even religious idealists, such as the Pilgrims, looked to this new world for opportunities for wealth and for social mobility that had not been available to them in England. And right from the start, European colonies in North America were commercial. In addition to fishing and growing tobacco and trapping beaver, the North American colonies all benefited from the booming sugar economy in the Caribbean. Islands such as Barbados that had once been self-sufficient had begun by the mid-1600s to specialize in just the cash crop of sugar at the expense of all other crops so that sugar planters looked to their neighboring colonies for food supplies and for feed for draft animals. John Winthrop, the Puritan leader who helped to establish Boston and who was governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony four times before 1650, sent his second son Henry to help establish Barbados in 1626. When Oliver Cromwell's Civil War halted the flow of commercial shipping between England and the only 10-year-old Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1640s, trade with the West Indies saved Boston's economy. Governor Winthrop's younger son Samuel then joined this growing community of New England merchants in the Caribbean Sugar Islands in 1647. About 16 million Africans were captured and transported to European slaveholding colonies during the entire period of Atlantic slavery. Only 12 million arrived alive, although some historians are estimating an even larger number died in transit. At least a quarter of all the slaves taken died on the voyage across the Atlantic. Although slavery reduced the African population by over 26 million people, 10 million into the Islamic world and 16 million to the Atlantic, American staples, including corn and manioc, created a population boom in Africa that actually exceeded the losses from the slave trade. However, we should ask ourselves if these 26 million or more people had been available to contribute to African society what type of social and cultural progress might have been possible. Additionally, since African nations, like other societies, tended to enslave captives in war, conflicts among tribes and kingdoms created an unstable social and political climate in Africa, which made Sub-Saharan Africa ripe for European imperialists in the later part of the 19th century, well after the slave trade with the Americas had ended. And we'll come back to that later in the semester. Under the Treaty of Tordesillas, you may remember, Spain was given everything west of the imaginary line, and Portugal was given Africa. So Spain was not allowed to purchase slaves in Africa because this territory had been granted to Portugal. So the Spanish set up a monopoly contract for slave trading to Spanish America called the Asiento, which was initially granted to France. In 1714, Spain shifted the Asiento to Britain and gave the South Sea Company a 30-year monopoly on selling slaves to Spain. The company set up distribution centers called factories at Cartagena in Colombia, Veracruz in Mexico, Portobello, Panama, La Guaira, Venezuela, Buenos Aires in Argentina, and Havana and Santiago de Cuba as well as in its own colonies of Barbados and Jamaica. In 1720, a speculative investment bubble burst, which threw the British economy into crisis. The South Sea Company survived the bursting of this bubble, mostly due to its revenues from selling slaves. And actually, its slave sales peaked in 1725, five years after the financial crisis. Conditions were so harsh on sugar plantations that slaves 
generally died after only about three years. Plantation owners could have changed their practices, but the reduced profits would have exceeded the replacement cost of the slaves. So the planters chose to work their slaves to death quickly and then just go and buy some more. The economic value of local, what was called increase, produced by enslaved women wasn't recognized till later in the 18th century in the North American colonies, where people like Thomas Jefferson wrote about the money that could be made with these natural replacements. Additionally, raising tobacco and other crops was a little bit less harsh than cultivating sugarcane, which created slightly better conditions for survival. Britain and the U.S. ended the slave trade in 1807 and 1808, but slavery continued in the United States, where enslaved people in mid-Atlantic states, where tobacco was being replaced by mechanized wheat farming, were not freed, but instead were used to produce new slaves that could be sold down the river, the Mississippi River, to the increasingly important cotton plantations in the Deep South, creating a major profit opportunity for white Virginians. Slaves often resisted their captors. Sometimes they ran away and formed independent communities in the remote backcountry called maroon colonies. Many of these maroon colonies became stable societies, populated by escaped slaves and by the descendants of Indians who had also run away from the colonists' earlier attempts to enslave them. And some lasted into the 20th century in Central and South America. Other times, the slaves rebelled, usually unsuccessfully, but not always. Traditional histories sometimes seem to not give enough attention to slave resistance. So here's a partial list of some of the notable revolts. There were a dozen more that I'm not going to mention in the 19th century. But here goes some. 1526, San Miguel de Guadalupe in Spanish Florida was victorious. 1570, Gaspar Yanga's revolt in Veracruz, New Spain, Mexico, was also victorious. 1712, the New York Slave Revolt was suppressed. 1730, the first Maroon War in British Jamaica was victorious. 1733, the St. John Revolt in Danish-controlled St. John was suppressed. 1739, the Stono Rebellion in the British province of South Carolina was suppressed. 1741, the New York Conspiracy in New York was also suppressed. 1760, Tacky's War in British Jamaica was suppressed. 1787, the Abaco Slave Revolt in the British Bahamas was suppressed. 1791, the Mina Conspiracy in Louisiana, which at that time was part of New Spain, was suppressed. 1795, the Point Coupe Conspiracy in Louisiana also suppressed. And then 1791 to 1804, the Haitian Revolution on what had been French Saint-Dominique was victorious. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. But first, some questions for discussion. Why would plantation owners choose to work their slaves to death rather than treat them better? And secondly, why don't we read more about these slave revolts in most history books, do you think?